Paula, I'll get back to you with a more detailed discussion of your um, your network in the assignment for. Okay. <laughs> Well, people are slow today. All right, <clears throat> let's get started. So um, this week I'm going to uh, bank, banking and mobility applications. Uh, next week, we'll, uh, Gregor will take the class and he will talk about the mechanics of the homework. He's already started some of those issues on the uh, Slack channel. Uh, do you, does anybody have any questions? All right, I'll get started. All right, so uh, last time we um, uh, talked about buy now, pay later was the last last uh, topic. And I just wonder, this is a very short section, really just defining what a neobank is. <clears throat> and um, here we have a um, couple of charts about neobanks. It divides them into uh, two types, full stack. Um, and also front end focused. Actually, I think it's a slightly artificial definition in that you have a banking system, which we'll mention later on as in more quantitatively, and you can actually have a company doing any part of that system. I guess you're only called a neobank if you do the whole system or the consumer front end part of the system. But actually it's a perfectly might have indeed more AI in the um, in the in the middleware, <clears throat> in the middle part of the system to look for um, look for fraud and things like that. Although there is AI at all parts of the of the stack. Um, and here was this chart of the um, uh, number of users, the number of accounts, and um, the value in billions of, uh, of dollars. And um, we see a clear growth of by, by the factor of four from 2018 to 2024. And um, this is the accounts in millions, 187 million. This is the users. And here's the value, um, I guess $63 billion is probably pretty small compared to all banks. And here is a pretty interesting chart. It says where neobanks are used. And you can see 
93% um, of the population of China use a neobank. And it's sort of interesting, it's not just, this is not an Asia Western difference, Singapore, which is of course not so far, well, it's uh, from my point of view, not so far from China, it is less than 1%. Uh, so it reflects maybe the type of society. And we have India, Brazil, very high, and more everybody else is pretty small, although the actual banks in the US, the neobanks in the US and UK are thriving. But there's also interesting, there is a pretty large uh, South American contingent of neobanks. Here is just, uh, these next slides are not so interesting, at least to me. They just go through um, neobanks in uh, various geographical segments. Here is um, four in, uh, in Europe and um, they don't actually get judged in the same way. This one has a focus on small and medium businesses. Uh, the, other, the others are more client faced and uh, they, these are, um, these, these all have banking licenses. So they're sort of full neo banks. But you can see they are geographically limited. Uh, Spain and Mexico. This one is pretty broad in, um, from South America to, to Europe. On the other, and so, and these, uh, you know, when we look at the uh, transition of industries, you will see some things which are very clearly AI driven and some things which are just more to do with digitization. I think these neobanks are more to do with modernization processing, which is dominantly digitization. Here's in US, um, <clears throat> with several million users or accounts for each of these, um, at least except for the these, uh, um, Moven doesn't, it doesn't say how many people they have and the $48 million funding is very low for a, for a serious uh, FinTech company. But you can see if they look at their notable features, these are just very standard um, uh, banking features. And the UK um, has its own set, as well as independent of Europe, has its own startups in this area. These also have banking licenses and actually they're at least as large as the ones in the US. And this here um, points out the um, two types again, the full stack and the front end. And we have so, and we have various focuses: uh, consumer and small and business, small and medium uh, sized businesses. So, but this is this slide is devoted to the ones on SMB, and you can see their own that that's viewed as a probably correctly as a pretty reasonable business model. Um, now it's, I mean, a sort of interesting number, which I mentioned already is that if you look at money, most money is locked up in, at least a huge amount of money is locked up in houses. And um, so the opportunity for um, FinTech companies in the real estate area is enormous. And this is just um, indicated by this list here of um, the different types of services from um, list, and, list and search and online settlement and leasing and events and property management, energy management, and so on. There's lots and lots of companies in different areas. And this is from, I mentioned CB Insights on the last uh, lecture I gave. They have this very nice report, which I took this out of. And this has a striking um, chart on the amount of debt. So there's $9 trillion debt in mortgages compared to 1.4 trillion for student loan, 1.25 for auto loan and a mere 850 billion in credit card. And um, here we see the plot of insure techs, and this shows the same feature as the other fintechs. 
if you really wanted to get into fintech, it's now a bit late. There was a pretty strong and increasing emphasis through 2016, and the number of um, startups has drastically decreased since then. And you can see up here, we have Standard Banks, Bank of America, Wells Fargo, Chase, and um, well, these are probably all, I don't know SunTrust, but US Bank is certainly a big bank. And uh, we have here um, mortgage lenders, well, Quicken must, be, I know Quicken from, they write software, uh, money software. So these are all part of the digital mortgage system. And there's it's sort of actually, I mean, there's companies like Zillow, which uh, you can use to search for new houses. But the whole, I remember when I last bought a house, which was 20 years ago, it was a huge amount of paper, but obviously that could all be digitized. There was no reason to have any paper in this, in the today's world and with this type of thing. I don't quite see the reason. Um, okay. Now we go a little more and directly into what AI uh, opportunity uh, there are in the banking system. And as I mentioned, we have these three areas, front end, consumer facing, um, middle office, where you have all the, probably the most, the richest opportunities. And in fact, uh, it's actually a little bigger than the front end and what they consider the value of AI. <clears throat> and the bank end is more a database uh, world. And um, that it's not so much, um, funding involved. These are just the estimates. These estimates are always pretty flaky, but an estimate of the cost saving due to AI. And they give here some examples like, oh, here the AI is in improving the interface between the user and the bank. Here it's in, such things as anti-fraud come in. Also, I'm sure there are lots of uh, stock investment type AI technologies in there as well. Um, so here is the front office. Um, and as actually in all industries, not just the banking industries, we have these miserable chat bots, which um, to, uh, I'm not quite certain they're in advance, maybe they are, but um, if they are intelligent enough, they really could be good. Uh, I'm not so clear they're very intelligent at all, but they are certainly actually better than they were a few years ago. And uh, these are also huge amounts of uh, investment in these areas is also going in, in the retail areas. And chatbots obviously have lots of AI in them. There's the AI to convert the uh, query from, from voice into text and then it, then there is the actual AI in interpreting the text correctly um, to make certain you give the right response. Um, biometrics, improving the security interface is clearly got plenty of um, opportunities. Personalized insights, this is like um, recommender engines on e-commerce sites and um, as I mentioned before, the investment area, whether that's front end or back end, I'm not certain. In that you would expect most of the investment AI opportunities be due to the analysis of all the stock uh, trading data. Well, I'm pretty certain that apart from some very broad advice, most uh, stock decisions and stock transactions can be automated. And we have seen lots of stories recently about one of our fintech companies, Robin Hood, and various um, various interesting um, scenarios coming about. Now here is um, more detail on the robo advisors, which are a form of, form of um, well, not really just a, a chatbot. They are actually trying to understand, tell people how to invest their um, money. And um, 
um, as and the claim was to actually make it more democratic so you didn't have to pay some broker a huge amount of money to to help you invest well, but uh, you could automate that. I actually suspect that it could all be, all, maybe I'm doing an injustice to, to stockbrokers, but um, I'm pretty certain that uh, this world is so complex that not too many, uh, then there are very, very few people who can actually keep up well with it. All right, well, we had um, 9 trillion in mortgage. Well, we have 43 trillion in stock assets. Well, no, maybe stock and bond assets in North America. So that's um, that's a lot of money. So that's one interesting feature of this field. There's so much money in it. So you can do a tiny little thing. Epsilon times 43 trillion is a pretty big number, unless epsilon is hugely small. And they say there was only of that 43 trillion, only 0.33 was actually done through robo advisors in 2019. Um, here is um, this estimate as a function of time going from 3.30 in 2019 to 8.30 compared to what I think it was 43 was the total. So this is still 2%. All right, now we come to this so-called middle office and the, the um, we, we see that at least in, in I see it quite often when uh, some credit card uh, cancels my my um, transaction because they think it's fraud, and uh, I have to explain that I'm in one country and my wife's in another country. That looks as though why it's fraud. It looks they spend it using the same credit, same credit, uh, sharing the same credit card, and that looks fraudulent across to them. So. Uh, that's the type of thing, actually, a good piece of AI could uh, almost certainly learn to avoid that particular false identification of fraud. And as well as fraud, uh, uh, stolen numbers and things like that, there's also um, money laundering. And um, there is something called know your customer compliance, which is uh, has to be evaluated. So this just allows faster real-time checks, which hopefully are more accurate. Um, and uh, so that when you get this alarming message on your cell phone saying, please call the XYZ credit card fraud department, it's more, more likely to be, uh, less likely to be false. Uh, well, obviously this is an entirely digital system and we have um, this back end and front end and middle and innovation is happening at the front end with all these novel ways of spending money through, um, through Apple watches or um, rubbing your ha hand on the ta active table or something like that. And then that all has to go through credit cards and through to the back end and so Gateways are very important because there's all sorts of uh, different APIs between these various services. This is a classic service system, which is very dependent on people agreeing on the APIs and having single point, single gateways, which understand multiple APIs and map from one set of APIs, those for the front end to another set of APIs, those to the back end. And, um, here is the, um, here's an interesting number that this is the revenue from fees for online retail payments that um, in 2016, that was 2.7% and it's slowly declining. Presumably, this is a, actually, I mean, you know, here we have um, billions of dollars. So we have $6 trillion up here. And we have 2.3% of it. So that's a lot of money. And so this whole field of paying, of, of, of um, enabling this pipeline from user to, to um, back end um, database, because probably money doesn't exist, at least unless it's a Bitcoin, it doesn't really exist. 
but it does exist on paper or it does exist as bits in a database. Um, but anyway, this, this is illustrative of why, remember I told you fintechs are really a lot of money put behind them. This 2.3% of 6 trillion is one of the reasons they have a lot of money behind them. This, uh, this, is a, this, this area has got more money than most other areas. Um, I mentioned banking as a service, and um, here we have. Um, the, the, so we have a we, so we have this game, this service, which goes from front end, middle tier, back end, and we have companies at different parts of the tier. Here we have this tier running down here, and um, there was p fees being charged to different. Uh, different people at different times. And um, here we have this important definition of interfaces, application interfaces, which you have to have, your gateway has to be taught so they, they can service lots of different banks from lots of different cards and things like that. And here, this is not a trivial problem. I'm actually a little surprised there aren't more than 16, this claim is there's 1,675 financial service related APIs. It's um, actually encouraging it's that small. You could imagine it would be, could be much larger because um, all of this stuff has happened inevitably in a rather ad hoc fashion with different people starting in different times and different places and likely to adopt a different API. Here is um, more information about the banking as a service with uh, somewhat more providers. Here's, here is um, um, some examples of the things you have to, the banking as a service people have to worry about. They have to worry how fast they are, whether they're reliable and so have a good reputation, what type of services, both deep and breadth, and whether they can actually scale up to deal with uh, deal with intense use, like Robin Hood again had this problem they had trouble dealing with the scale up of their use of their services for the uh, game stock and AMC stocks. Okay, and we have this uh, type, different types of models, those which actually are a real bank with money in the, money in the database and those which aren't. Here are a few AI examples rather, um, rather broadly based. Uh, this is not an AI example, it's just a piece of data telling you um, how many transactions there are per year. So we have 165 billion visa transactions in 2018. And even poor old Discover Card at the bottom here, although these are all pretty large vendors, they have 2.8 billion per year. And look, but the um, Union Pay, which is from China, Visa and MasterCard dominate with American Express um, way behind. But it of course has a different business model of a certain elitist attitude. And um, I already mentioned um, trading stocks and there are lots and lots. Here we have our favorite one, at least the one I know you hear most about uh, Robin Hood, but there are many players in this field, including traditional players, Goldman Sachs, JP Morgan, um, and so on. Coinbase, I think, is trades um, Bitcoins. All right, and here we have S&P and Bloomberg. These are traditional people. So this, the plot, there are lots of plots like this. They also all illustrate the richness of the system at the moment. Um, this, you know, once you get well established, you end up with say half a dozen giant banks and that's it. But now we're in a different world. We're redoing everything. And uh, I'm assuming five, ten, 10 years from now, there will be far fewer entries here because some entries will have gone, gone down the drain. Uh, probably most of them are just going to be purchased by uh, other people. Here is a really um, trivial example. Remember, if you remember, we have things like paper notes and uh, coins. And uh, 
counting coins is uh, licking your hand or counting notes or counting coins is not it's one of the uh, one of the chores that bankers have to do you probably have to have had to done for thousands of years and uh, now we have a robot which counts coins i mean a physical robot and um, it has a hand manipulator and cameras and grabbers and things um, well here's an amusing example of um, AI and insurance. People, I mean, I, there are various tales of this um, uh, this field where um, you know, pe the uh, your cell phone can uh, use its accelerometer measurements to uh, monitor your driving behavior and then send that back in real time to an insurance agency. Uh, who can then decide whether or not to charge you more when you renew your uh, renew your uh, um, your pre your insurance automobile insurance and um, there are, but there is um, quite a lot of other applications like that. Um, Lemonade is a well known company in the U.S. and um, it has chatbots, and um, this is an example that I gave. This route collects data on driving behavior. Um, this um, this next insurance offers uh, AI services which do interviews to try to quantify uh, claims quickly. Um, Plank does a lot of background checks. Um, is a more interesting one, Tractable. It actually has AI for accident and disaster recovery. So when you claim your car was totaled and the costs are not totaled and the, it, uh, you have a picture of it or a list of its issues, and then you get a quote, Tractable will pick that apart and tell the insurance agency uh, how reasonable your estimate is. So this allows insurance to operate faster and possibly with greater accuracy. Um, so here we have, we look for unnecessary repairs or whether it can be replaced or repaired and then estimates the, um, <coughs> the costs. Of course, I'm sure that uh, well, you can still claim it gets the wrong answer, but you would think good AI which learned from the past should be able to get this to work. Um, here we come back to this other example. These are a set of examples, chatbots um, with um, different mature functionalities and um, uh, end user deployment and, and business of what things they actually decide on. And um, they claim that will be $6 billion in 2025. And um, it is mainly adopted by companies because it's more efficient than hiring large telephone banks, which uh, the problem is it's probably pretty hard to train the operators of telephone banks to tell them to know the right answer. Here we have another example, Royal Bank of Canada, a relatively big bank, which is using AI to just customize their interface to, uh, with, with customers by Looking at whether they're well, you know, look doing what Amazon does, looking at what um, the customer has purchased and <clears throat> and uh, try to get a, a more personalized interface to the customer. Well, here's a very classic one that we looked at the MNIST database that was originally aimed at, I think it's now mainly aimed at benchmarking, but it was originally aimed at um, um, bootstrapping the handwriting recognition um, industry. And um, as I pointed out when buying a house, there's lots and lots of written material in this field. And it will be good to get rid of it all. And uh, so here we have a handwriting recognition company, which is focusing on um, in the insurance field. And here's a yet another amusing uh, example, which is uh, detecting leaks. 
So it is actually a, a sensor which is installed in your, um, in your house plumbing and it, it actually monitors it and detects water leaks and um, points out that if there's a leak, then the colder water comes from outside the home and you can detect that temperature change. And it's all, of course, connected to a smartphone. And um, well, this particular company even has a team of engineers who mend the leak. Um, and of course, one issue with water leaks is they often are underground. There's lots of water pipes that are, are in rather, when you don't like having water pipes visible then all your rooms in your in your business business installations or what have you and so detecting leaks is not so trivial so any technology that can like, identify the uh, identify a leak and identify its location has to have some value all right so that's what i had on um uh Ah, we have more people now. There are only five of you when I started. Um, is there, a, is, what does the chat say? All right, so that's Gregor, good. Well, he'll be with you in detail next week. Uh, are there any questions on banking? I would say banking is not so easy for people in, the, in, in, in academia to, to make major progress with, because all that's pretty proprietary information. But as you see from the large numbers, it's a very promising area. It was a very promising area for startups, and it still probably has a lot of opportunities, but most of the investment money has already been given out in this area. Any, any further questions? All right, so let's move on to transportation. All right, so uh, this one here is on um, Mobility and transportation systems, and let's first define those those topics. All right, so this is a, this top this area is divided into two. The first is the actual transportation system, where um, there is both AI digitization and electrical power, which is revolutionizing it. And uh, this is also, um, you, could, you could say this is a product of AI and digitization ride hailing, which is also changing the industry. And I think I've already pointed this out that um, actually the market va value of GM compared to Tesla is increasing. While it went down, while it just decreased and then increased, it was, um, uh, 50% of Tesla at the start of 2020. It was 11% in fall of 2020, and now it's 14%. Um, the market is betting that all these old traditional companies will do better once the pandemic is over. I'm not so convinced the market is correct. I think all these changes the pandemic has made are actually, many of them will stay and the, the value of companies like Tesla will not disappear. I think I may mention there is a company called Cruise, which GM purchased, and Cruise is GM's self-driving um, um, department. And um, this purchasing of Cruise is what I mentioned already, as you saw already in the uh, banking case. The, the startups are being purchased by the established companies. And um, here's a comment on what you actually need to do self-driving, where you need some sensors, 
you need to pour computers into your cars or self-driving autonomous vehicles. You need some complex algorithms and of course you need software. You also have a need experience, which is the training data. Uh, my assumption is algorithms are the main bottleneck, but the others, especially the sensors, will the non-trivial non -trivial improvements will surely happen. Um, in this uh, other topic of electrical power, I mean, I got, I got my uh, for Tesla three years ago. At that time, I was sort of worried that electrical power and Tesla would survive. Um, as I tend to be an early adopter, I got that. And I, I, I must admit, I'm a pretty happy customer. And as far as I can see, uh, given all the announcements from companies which are going to switch from gasoline to electrical power, electrical power has uh, gone from being interesting five years ago to almost bound to happen now. And various people, countries and companies have announced that they will be carbon free or all electric by some sort of date. Probably, um, the electrical power component is mainly driven by battery technology. Because, and that is significantly improved and is continuing to improve. And that imp I mentioned that when we discussed uh, energy, lots and lots of startups in the battery area because everything needs to, you, the batteries are essential to have a reliable use of renewable energy. And I also noted in the, um, energy uh, discussion that all these large, bad, fat, fat, pretty large, comparatively large batteries, uh, in at least they're larger than the ones in um, the flashlights, in cars are going to provide actually a pretty large um, way of store, large storage area for electrical power. All right, and ride hailing is sort of split between the Mobility industry, because it's implemented there, but it's built upon the concepts in the transportation system section. And uh, so that's described here, which is the second few set, sets of slides, which is that there's a whole, that the transportation industry is split into two. Um, we're actually building the car or the vehicle is possibly the least important part of it all. There is actually moving people around. And then there's also the building the system, the controls and monitors how they move around. And so for example, for um, ride hailing, um, well, the Uber and Lyft uh, use, um, use AI to match drivers and customers and try to optimize the positioning of their drivers to minimize the time they have to spend getting to a customer. And uh, as, as we're going to go into a world that in a few years time, not maybe a few, in some time, I don't know, 20 years, 10 years, who knows, we will be, uh, all vehicles will be connected and at least subject to, to global control. Um, that um, these transportation systems are much most more broadly important outside ride hailing. They're going to be essential for this um, connected vehicle transportation system. And probably the transportation system will prefer self driving cars to human driving cars. And uh, if we look back at our computing legacy, where we talked about clouds and fogs and edges. The transportation system is a very good example where we have central clouds, uh, we have um, tiny, tiny computers on the individual sensors on the car, and then every car will, will have its own so called fog computer which controls all the devices in the car. And maybe every um, road region will have its own uh, computers to control it. So when you get these complex, uh, freeway interchanges, maybe there will be a little box next to the next to the interchange containing the computers to try help manage that um, that area because you want to have for some tasks you want to have the computers near the near the action just because of the 
limitations of the speed of transmitting information. So you don't really want to spend time sending it back to back to the cloud, because once you send it back to the cloud, it's very difficult to get answers back less than a three, few hundred milliseconds, maybe maybe 100 milliseconds. Um, um, of course, there's a wonderful amount of this field of self-driving has been rapidly advanced because of the huge uh, advances in image processing and the use of net deep learning for image processing. And in fact, it's probably driven a lot of those advances, but it, it actually is much more general than um, it has other things besides uh, image processing because you need to have um, you need to have root planning, avoidance, to t I mean, planning algorithms, which will not be uh, convolutional neural nets. Um, so that's sort of mentioned here that the uh, transportation system itself for routing and global uh, planning and things, um, uh, estimating where, the, where there will be bottlenecks and trying to reroute cars to avoid them. Those will not be uh, convolutional neural nets. They will be uh, more more general graph neural nets and things like that. Because the transportation system is a graph. All those roads connecting to each other is a is a nice graph which can be processed with gra graphical neural nets. All right. So here we get this first set of lectures on the actual automobile part of this, and here are some topics. General remarks, which we've already effectively done on the future, the ride hailing, some comments on whether people will have their own cars or do um, robo taxis, a rather trivial example of uh, AI for cleaning, an interesting example of an application to medical transportation. There's a society of automobile engineers and Gartner who are going to tell you their predictions for self driving. Then we have a discussion of AI, deep learning for self-driving with NVIDIA, one of the world's most successful companies in the computer era, era at least. One of the reasons it's so, so successful is it's a huge role in the self-driving industry. It's got its large internal efforts in self-driving. <coughs> and of course, it's all motivated to provide customers for its um, GPUs like the latest A100, which uh, IU has on its supercomputer. But NVIDIA will sell more of those to put inside your, your um, self autonomous car than it will to, to data centers, just because there's so many more cars. Um, we have just got general discussion of AI in the industry. Waymo is, um, Waymo, Cruise, and NVIDIA are major companies in this area. I mentioned Cruise and NVIDIA already. Waymo is the startup from Google. We all have a little comment about uh, trucks, and, uh, trucks and autos for electrical power and drones and robots. So, there are more details on, I'm not going to go through the full set of slides. I just selected some of it. My fully recorded lectures have everything. Um, so this is, I mean, this, I already mentioned this. Actually, the automobile industry in terms of units sold is in a long-term decline, not drastic, but uh, it's going to decline partly because people are just not going to use car, their own cars as much. They would rather call a robo taxi or an Uber, I mean, a self driving human driven taxi. And there is 43% um, uh, of the auto industry executives thought that over half of today's car owners won't want a car in 2025. So that's a pretty big change. It's only five years, less than five years from now. And uh, this study was in 2018, it's probably inaccurate, but it suggests that there was a sh significant shift. Um, so that's why there's a much greater, in, given the number of cars is going to go down, part, I mean, one, there was one slide later on pointing out that the um, ride hailing and robo taxis produces a much higher utilization rate for cars. And so you need that to get the same number of people driven around, you need fewer cars. 
and um, so if when we so mo, the right heading market, where well, of course Uber and Lyft are the best known, and Didi in China, that is um, a huge market, but it's not so obvious those particular players will be the future dominant players. Um, and in fact, uh, it's a big market, 285 billion by 2030. And um, who, it's, it's not quite clear who will own that because the people who own the transportation systems will also have a, be a major player in that market. Because actually building that, the interface that Uber and Lyft has is not such a difficult thing to do. I think there's, uh, there are, you can get that online uh, open source software. Um, so as well as ride hailing, we have the uh, non-human version of uh, ride hailing. And, um, but the automakers, you see the 20, the, making the car is now no longer, a, it's not a growth area because the number of cars is going down. The use of cars might even go up because we're gonna actually um, drive each car more if we do it, if we make each car a robo taxi. Um, and um, this means that the uh, automobile companies have to reposition them. They're not going to be getting all their money from banging steel into cars. They're going to get money from all these other, other added values by being experts on sensors and uh, automated repair systems and things like that. So that's what this point out. The number of ways of getting money in this field is growing. And they're going to be startups in each of those new areas. And then we have these giant existing companies which own what used to be the dominant source of money, uh, knocking steel together to, and putting adding wheels to make a car. It, that is no longer the most exciting place to be, although it's still there, but it's sort of a service because all, there's not so much innovation in that probably anymore. I mean, I can have to put your sensors in the right place, but I doubt if that uh, needs uh, too much innovation. That you, and it also has to come from a company that has lots of data as to where the sensors ought to be. So companies like GM and Ford and Renault and Fiat and what have you, I don't even know, remember now which ones are still alive. Um, they have to change significantly. And we have to see how that happens. Here is this, um, one of these uh, surveys I mentioned, uh, uh, which uh, gives a fraction of how many people would prefer to use self-driving uh, self cars. And it's um, 10 years from now, people seem pretty confident and at least in the, these numbers are uh, the lowest 57%. And they get up to 72% in China. Uh, China, as we see, is pretty forward-looking in most areas, partly because it didn't have so much of the past. Countries like the US and Europe have this problem. They have a pretty rich past and trying to manage a transition into the future from a rich past is not so easy because you have to replace the past, which is both technically difficult and socially difficult. Um, we know people who pointed out that jobs, it's not so obvious the number of jobs will go down. What is obvious is the jobs will change. And here is a very trivial small, uh, uh, small, small uh, snippet on autonomous cleaning for vehicles. Here's a self-driving, I mean, we have a rumba uh, vacuums running around our homes where we can have a self-driving uh, uh, clean, cleaning our self-driving vehicle automatically. And this will be presumably used by the um, self-driving car companies um, who will then clean it between uh, different uh, robo-taxi uh, rides. Here was something I mentioned, which is that um, relatively large market is the health market because the um, a lot of the health is connected to people who aren't so mobile because they're ill. And so having some automated transportation of either ill people to hospital or medicines to ill people is quite a large market. 
and it's called um, Non Emergency Medical Transportation, NEMT, which actually you can charge to Medicaid. And Uber and Lyft both work in this area. And it's according to here, it's meant to be uh, 15 billion. I mean, Uber even has an Uber Health Department uh, exploiting uh, this type of um, opportunity. And as well as Uber, we have Ford also working in this area. So you can see this is just a variant of the Uber and Lyft interface. Here is a background information. We can look and see what the Society of Automobile um, Engineers thinks is going, is going on. And um, we have everything from what it used to be 20 years ago, no automation, human did everything, to level five, human does everything. No, sorry, the car does everything. Under all roadway and environmental conditions, torrential rain, snowstorm, fog, uh, the human driver has no, no role. Um, here we have three and four are probably the most interesting. Four is high automation and um, in conditional automation where the human is, has some sort of involvement. Um, and um, the human is really, the last two are uh, human free, but then four, it doesn't uh, actually work in all circumstances. I mean, it's not so obvious that you can actually to teach these self-driving technologies to drive in violent uh, conditions is not so obviously possible. You probably have to teach it to go to the side and road and stop, with, uh, which might even be the right thing to do. Uh, unless you have wonderful sensors to detect the, otherwise you get these terrible stories of a hundred vehicles crashing on a, in a fog on a freeway or something. Anyway, so this is what the essay, these levels of four and five are what people fight about. I think we believe we're at three at the moment. Uh, here is um, Gartner, I mentioned Gartner. They have hype cycle, these hype cycles here is a, the 2019 hype cycle for emerging technology. And we have here level five autonomous driving is um, up here on the uh, innovation trigger. Level four has come down from its peak and is presumably hopefully going up to the productivity plateau. However, Gartner is, has for many years been very, very negative about the time scale of self-driving cars. I don't think they're correct, actually. I mean, even though the distinguished industry uh, evaluate, I'm pretty certain it will happen before they think. Anyway, as is emphasized in the next slide, that was a mistake. I pressed the wrong button. Here's the next slide. Um, this is this uh, priority matrix associated with the previous slide. And here we have more clearly when this will happen. Autonomous driving levels four and five are transformational and will happen in more than 10 years. So that's, um, that's their evaluation. And flying autonomous vehicles is only moderately useful, but it's also 10 years. <coughs> they uh, meant uh, where we have light cargo. So they think Drone delivery of at least uh, some tucks, some modest uh, size objects will happen because that's already happening today. Uh, so I, I, but I again, I doubt it will take five years to deploy. These are the people who did this are conservative. But anyway, then really, it illustrates the types of debates that are going on in the industry. People are betting on very on the time scale of various transitions. So let's now look a little at the AI. And if you really want to um, learn about AI, uh, here are lots of uh, tutorials and um, links for AI presentations. NVIDIA is particularly strong in this area. I mentioned why, because they're trying to they're trying to dominate the um, sales in this field. 
And uh, I pointed out, we have to do all sorts of things, position our car correctly, plan how to go in the future, to find the obstacles and preferably read road signs and um, distinguish between US 66 and 66 miles per hour speed limit. Something at least the initial um, AI in cars did not do. And so we go from this picture, which we can get from our built-in uh, LiDAR or webcams. We go into a deep learning network, which will be convolutional. And out of that, through some logic, will come what we have to do to go with a little minor adjustment, go full, go straight, or make a turn. So this is a key. This this picture here captures a key issue, which is described in several of these tutorials. And here is a little bit more detail on the actual convolutional neural net that Nvidia has in their tutorial. They have three cameras and they're trying to this, uh, map the views of those cameras into an instruction for the car to change direction. And you can just see what types of networks they have. And they have a mix, which we've already done, a mix of multi-layer perceptron fully connected and convolutional layers. So this is not an especially innovative network, but it is a modern network. Here is just some examples. There's more detail in the slides, I, in the recorded slides. Here, here is some example of um, types of things we need to do. We have to map the lanes. This is here we, here we found out the lane markings and the track, put, track the, the lanes. We've identified the car, cars in front of us, um, which is what we have to do, especially for, we have to measure their speed because maybe one of these cars is stopped due to a problem or something. And then we also, as we say here, I'm not, I can't, this is a Chinese picture, but um, which we can obviously take this um, road sign, um, run our CNN on it, break it up into regions, and we have to then interpret those regions for able to make the uh, correct uh, driving decisions. Here's an interesting aside that, uh, which I think I've actually mentioned, the not only is mobility getting from A to B uh, being revolutionized, but also um, construction industries and things like that. And they're getting dirt from A to B. That's all going to be um, self I mean, made autonomous. In fact, it's probably a little easier to make autonomous than cars. Because if you have a, one of these uh, giant devices here with a scoop or a bulldozer, they're going to only operate in certain limited regions where you tend to have to just navigate correctly and make the right decision on what dirt to pick up. You, you're not trying to dodge a hundred other cars rushing around you. So the robotic industry, the uh, construction industry, which is one of the most traditional long-term industries, it's gonna be revolutionized. And I think it's, this is already starting. Remember I went to a conference in China, which also discussed this point. That was uh, maybe three years ago. Here is an interesting point that um, the, um, you not only actually take real data, you um, also to do, uh, we, they had 10 million real miles driven, but 7 billion, almost a thousand times um, more, which were driven virtually and then they came from a simulation. And that's a key feature in a lot of uh, neural network applications. Um, I mentioned AlphaFold, which is the one that's predicting protein, protein structure. A lot of the data into AlphaFold will come from simulations. Not all of it, some will be observed, but uh, fields where you can simulate reliably, the uh, answer is very good because the simulated data always has, is always labeled. And you know whether whether you crashed or not, or whether what decision you made. So you can map your decision into the images. And of course, you can actually manipulate the simulation 
to get some, uh, you know, suppose you want to get more data on driving in the rain, but you just add rain to your sim simulation and pour rain into your real-time rendering of your um, outside images and see if you can still detect everything. So, and um, Tesla actually has a lot of um, built-in <coughs> built uh, training data. So Tesla being a leader in this area has a significant advantage in terms of well, both Waymo and Tesla. They both have significant uh, data resources, which as far as I know are not available to anybody else. And those are critical for them to be able to train the correct networks. So we know them. Big data, is, these are all big data, these are enormous data. And as far as I know, none of this, very little, one of the troubles with this particular field is like banking. The data is just not available. It's all secretly hidden inside um, databases in Google and Tesla clouds. Um, so here is a more general set of uh, slides on AI and in the automobile industry. And um, we really pointed out that there's reducing the, um, that AI as seen in right handing is reducing the need for cars. Um, and uh, Lyft found that a uh, quarter of a million of customers sold their cars uh, because of ride hailing. And um, AI can be used to, um, to say, so we're like, well, we're changing the industry. So we're now using AI to change the business model by decreasing the cost of production and increasing the <coughs> number of ways of charging people. And this is not, a, this is only 173 billion cost saving in the manufacturing processing, um, where the spent the cost manufacturing can presumably greater use of robots and things will lead to 61 billion cost saving. And the new revenue stream is best illustrated by self-driving. And um, it's meant to be over half, over five, well, almost $600 billion. That's pretty good. And it's growing almost 40% year to year because that will go, that went down a little glitch. This slide is before COVID. So we had a one year glitch in that, but uh, it will continue to grow. Um, but here's this comment I made about um, car usage. Namely, it seems a personal car that's on average uses of 5%. Uh, I must admit my usage has gone down to far less than that due to the pandemic. Whereas if you have a fleet car, one which is just shared, that can be 50%. Now, of course the car won't last as long, but that just means your fleet cars are more attractive because they're always modern. And um, that translates into a cost per mile that is almost a dollar per mile for a personal car and 30 cents per mile for a fleet car. And that is, you know, I, I think I drive 10,000 miles per year. That's about $7,000 a year. And this is, this, this is an interesting graph here about um, the opportunities. Uh, but automakers are here. Here we have the hub of the current thing, building the cars. But here we have the uh, things at the edge, so building the cars here. Here we have these um, marketing, design, research and development, self-driving hardware and software, customer uh, interactions. And then we have, here we have self-driving fleet companies. So the opportunities are not here, they're here and possibly here. So that's what it says. It says this is a so-called smile curve. You should be at the ends here. You should be here and here. Here's a few more pictures. This is one on Waymo. I think Waymo has driven, 
or Tesla has the most data because they have all their own drivers, but those data is not directly translatable probably to, they're not done with the right, uh, I don't think they have the um, full um, video mileage and everything like, but Waymo has the most experience of self-driving autonomous vehicles and uh, their disengagement rate, which is presumably means when their cars have to be helped is uh, 10%. Uh, 10% per thousand miles, so once every 10,000 miles. So that's not so bad if you think that's a typical driving year. So at the moment it's once per year. Um, here is a s estimated uh, number of sales for almost uh, SAE four and five up to uh, 2.6 million, which is quite small actually in 2023. And here is an estimate of where we can use AI, manufacturing, procurement, uh, sales and marketing, research and development. But the real AI is actually in the interpretation of sensors of self-driving cars. And that is not in the, this graph is AI in the actual making of the car. Here we just mentioned these three leaders, uh, Waymo, Cruise and NVIDIA and um, they each have different uh, different uh, things they focus on. Um, I'm a little surprised that Waymo isn't more, I mean, I'm not quite certain what Waymo's business model is because it has uh, naively the best technology because it has the most experience. Um, and, but, uh, but it keeps on having the best technology without uh, without uh, killing everybody else in the marketplace, which you think they ought to try to do, because it's, you only have a, you know, you're only number one for a short period of time. You can't just sit there. Uh, all these other companies are rapidly catching up. Cruise, I mentioned already, and it, it has quite a bit of experience. And then we have um, Nvidia. So Cruise is working also with Honda as well as GM. Uh, and in fact, the car companies in general are collaborating because they all know that they're, they're in for a real shake up and a real problem. And so they're biting the bullet and they'd rather collaborate them with, with themselves, with their, who uh, at least know what's going on and they understand each other than probably Google, which is a foreign body to them or even NVIDIA. So, but NVIDIA is developing both the software, I should point it out there, AI software, and it's, um, here it is, it's working with more than 25 automakers to bring level five by 2021. Remember Gartner said it wouldn't be here for 10 years. And um, so he, uh, NVIDIA thinks that the AI driven car technology is $8 billion by 2025. Um, so, I think this area is still really promising. His exact status is a little unclear because you can't really believe anything an Elon Musk says, but the Elon Musk is so successful, you have to worry about what he says. Uh, so, but you don't quite know which of what he says is correct. Um, and let's just, we'll, we'll finish the, uh, the day with these set, a few slides here. They came from a pretty good talk that uh, fellow Will Brooks from General Motors gave at a Department of Energy meeting I went to about a year ago. And um, this was their goal, which is sort of interesting. I mean, it's a, these are good goals, zero crashes, zero emissions, zero congestion. And zero emissions is electric, zero crashes is AI to avoid crashes. And congestion is the transportation system to manage the traffic correctly. So we know what can we have to do. Um, and um, they're meant to be currently 28 mega cities with populations exceeding 10 million people. And that's meant to grow to 41 by 2030. And he says, this is not the solution, more of these. This is a pretty amusing um, freeway interchange. I pointed out that they may be strapped to this uh, pillar, we would have our local fog computer full of um, 
full of high-end uh, graphics processors to, to help the cars navigate this rather complex um, uh, network, complex set of roads and um, get them through them quickly. And then I pointed out, you have to have them here. You can't have them in the car because there may be too many. The, the car may need more computing than can, you can put in cost effectively. And you can't have it in the cloud because the, tra the uh, travel time from the car to the cloud is too high. So you need to put it here so that we, the car can more or less instantaneously um, communicate. Here is their, um, here's why General Motors has finally endorsed electric cars. And I would agree they are not much nicer to drive than other than uh, traditional cars, and they, they have wonderful acceleration, which actually is safe, it makes you feel safer. And they're quiet as well. I think the only thing that held them back was batteries, because I don't think Tesla considers making the electric motor itself a great challenge. What's really the challenge is the battery. And I don't think Tesla's initial battery technology was especially innovative. It was just gluing together lots of uh, existing batteries, medium, very pretty small batteries, just a thousand batteries all, all uh, glued together or wired together. Here is a uh, discussion of where we can use uh, AI. And um, this is called vehicle to everything. We have vehicle to vehicle, vehicle to infrastructure, which remember we have the smart infrastructure with four computers. And we also have vehicle to pedestrians, pedestrians and cyclists. And we have to interpret all these signals. And uh, we have to be very mindful of uh, the other vehicles. And here is sort of a time scale, 2017. Now you do basic warning, 2020 a more serious warning. And 2022 onwards, you just solve the problem. Uh, here is a de depiction of how uh, sensors might uh, might be um, deployed on a car. So um, you can see uh, different sensors with different uh, fields of view. And they're uh, looking largely forward and backward. And also to the side, you don't really want to hit anything on your side. And um, you have to do this um, planning of how to, uh, like here we have a stalled car, traffic passing us here, and now we have to get from here to here. And that requires, uh, actually it would be better if you could communicate with these cars. That's why the concept of a transportation system is quite interesting. I think you would have a more efficient system. If you want to get past this car, I suspect, it would be a lot easier if these four cars could talk to each other quite directly in a very meaningful fashion, rather than talk to each other by suggestion, which is what happens now with human drivers. You sort of suggest, hi, I want to move. I want to, I want to go out. Let me go, please. If, don't, don't, don't crash into me. And then there are various games of chicken that go on. And then we have to control so that when we go through, go through a curb, we do not do this we do this. So we have to have the correct turning angles at each stage. And we have to take here, this is trying to point out, we have to take all our input and turn it into what's called scene understanding, which is a global depiction of this scene in terms of cars, pedestrians, and bicycles. And we have to also, there's a nice picture describing how we do mapping and localization. Here we have roads where we need to locate ourselves on the existing, we need, we will obviously have maps. We have to locate ourselves on those roads. Okay, so why don't I stop there? I, I have a lot, quite a little bit more detail on what General Motors is doing the types of AI that are being used. I'll do that um, not next week, the week after next. And Gregor will be here next week. All right.
questions? I don't have oh, a yeah, question I'm... here. Oh, sorry. Oh, I don't have a question per se, but I found it interesting that more recently Uber sold their uh, autonomous vehicle uh, research division um, because apparently it was too expensive to run or, or something. Yeah, like well, I mean, there's, there's, you don't really need 10 winners in that field. And given the way, I remember they had a huge legal fight with Waymo because they stole an engineer from Waymo and that, that engineer took Waymo's secrets with, with, with him. Um, so I think that was simply a correct business decision. Even though self-driving, I mean, that's why I say it's interesting to look at GM and Ford and, and Fiat and Bill. It's not, or Honda, it's not so obvious those companies will all survive. So what you have to do something, you can bang metal, Build, build AI systems to control cars. You can build AI systems to solve, serve car, solve car systems. It's not, I, we don't need, I, you don't, I doubt if Uber has enough resources to be competitive with Waymo, because Waymo was far ahead of Uber. Because Google started, not, not because, I don't think it's particularly that Google's bigger than Uber, which it is. I think it's just that, um, Google started first. I think Google Waymo was the first. You know, Google has these bets, like you know, some which don't work, like balloons delivering internet or something. But um, some of them work, and one of those is Waymo. But I say I don't think Waymo is a profit area for Google. I don't think they have a good business model. That's why I find it quite interesting and surprising. There ought to be a. Uh, you know, on that press announcement, 23 car companies adopt Waymo technology number 23. And maybe we'll see that. Because I don't think Waymo itself can take self-driving technology very easily and win on its own, because then it would have to, it has to partner with somebody to, with the cars and the sensors. Because, um, and, that's what NVIDIA is doing. NVIDIA, which has a rather clearer model, because it's a company that makes computers and sells computers, and all cars have to have computers, they certainly have a very trivial business model. They take their GPUs and the, and the software and customize it to, for self-driving cars. Any other comments? Right, this is pretty interesting. In my opinion, this is pretty interesting. I mean, enormous. If you look at what it was expected, probably the progress has been much more than expected. Much more. I don't think, say, when I bought my Tesla when it was three or four years ago, I did not expect it to be such a dominant company as it is now. Um, I remember talking to somebody else at uh, IU, had a Tesla, Brad Wheeler. And I said, I'm worried. What will happen if it goes under? How do I maintain my car? And he said, no, it's OK. There are enough Teslas, it will be OK. And he was not only, he was, that was before Tesla's success was clear. Now it's pretty clear. I mean, it still can go under, actually, because these, this is such a topsy-turvy area. And if they make the wrong bet, they take the wrong sensors on their cars, they could fall, fall behind. Because there's some controversy as to what the right sensors is. But they ought to make the right decisions because they obviously have brilliant engineers because they can make brilliant cars. And I assume that they can also choose good sensors. But they do choose different sensors, say, from Waymo. So they, the people, you have to choose which, which wavelength you detect in, LiDAR or video and things like that. Gregor, do you have any comments? Uh, yeah, but only to the next week preparation for the next week lecture. Why don't you put that in the uh, Slack channel? Yeah, okay. So that was the other thing is, is, is please, everybody, please read the Slack channel. And uh, you do need to be prepare, uh, preparing for the next week uh, with tasks. From I'll make week. that the homework. I didn't do a homework because uh, really the rest of the homework is writing your project. So 
I will tell them the, why don't you send me a note and I'll, Gregor, and I will make it the homework to prepare for me. Um, I, I, I think it's already posted in the Slack channel. It's just oh, remembering. Yeah, everybody I will make must the formal be. homework, then they will get points yeah. for it. Oh, okay. Okay, good. Okay, thank you, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.